I think Uzumaki is perhaps Junji Ito's most well-known work, as well as his best work. Essentially, I think this story is an exercise in seeing how far you can run with a single idea, because every single chapter in the story revolves around spirals. The story takes place in a town that is cursed by spirals, and so every single chapter in the story deals with different kinds of spirals. And as you see through reading this work, you can get real creative with a single idea like this. I never would have expected this, but there are so many things in normal everyday life that involve spirals that can then be turned into horrifying events. So Uzumaki is super popular and super excellent. It's just a fun read overall. But what I find most interesting about it is the fact that it's a horror work, yet it does not stick to only one kind of horror. In fact, I would go so far as to say that it's kind of all over the place. It's very messy in the different types of horror that it draws upon. Some parts of Uzumaki are more grounded and realistic and just very, very dark and disgusting feeling, but then other parts are more fantastical and silly. And I think it's a very interesting work for that reason, just because of the fact that it switches between different kinds of horror and it doesn't even really stick to only one type in one section of the book. I think that the further the story goes along, the more fantastical it gets, but there's crazy stuff all throughout the story. And I think that not only is the horror of the story messy, I think that the way the story is told is very messy as well, because it is billed as one long continuous story, and it is, because it starts the same characters from beginning to end. But at the same time, Uzumaki is made up of 19 different chapters, and they don't all move the story forward in the same way. I would go so far as to say that there are certain chapters that you could probably take out and nothing would be lost. For that reason, Uzumaki in my mind has never really sat well as just one long continuous story up until the end. I think at the end, Uzumaki comes together in a really powerful way, but I think that probably for the first half, maybe even three quarters of the story, there are certain chapters that pop up that aren't really necessary for the plot. And I think it's the messiness of Uzumaki's horror that makes the story so interesting to me. Horror authors messing around in different types of horror is nothing new. One of my favorite examples of a horror writer playing around with different subgenres of horror is Clive Barker's Books of Blood. In those books, you have splatterpunk, super gory type stuff, then you have comedy horror, you have stuff that's more psychological in nature. And so in some ways, it feels like this is what Junji Ito is trying to do with this book. It does feel to me like Junji Ito is trying to draw upon different types of horror and trying to bring them together under the umbrella of one story, Uzumaki. And and so because of that, it's a super interesting read. It's a very messy read, I think, and I think it's a little bit uneven, but I think it's absolutely fantastic just because it is so creative and engaging. As I stated before, I never would have guessed how much crap you could do with spirals until I read this book. So there are two main characters in this story, really. There's Kiri, who's the girl, and then there's Suichi, who's the boy. Kiri and Suichi are a couple. They're in love, they're teenagers, they're going to high school. They both live in this small Japanese town, but Suichi goes to school outside of town because he's cool or something. Not really. From the start of the book, it seems like Suichi has caught on to the fact that there's something wrong with this town, there's something cursed about it. And the first couple chapters of this story revolve around his parents and how they've been affected by the spiral curse that is placed upon this town. And I think these first couple chapters are incredibly, incredibly dark. I think they have some weird, more fantastical stuff happening in them for sure, but at the same time, I think that these first couple chapters are significantly more grounded and therefore more disturbing to me than the rest of the piece. Basically in the first chapter, Suichi's dad is a weirdo and he becomes obsessed with the spiral. He gets to the point where he's not going to work because he's just obsessing over spirals. Very cool guy. Suichi's dad approaches Kiri's dad about making a pot for him because Kiri's dad is a potter. And Suichi's dad says, I'm sure you will understand how wonderful the spiral is. It is perfect, the most sublime art. I find the spiral to be very mystical, he says. It fills me with a deep fascination like nothing else in nature, no other shape. And I think it's a really great move for Junji Ito to introduce us to the spiral concept through one character like this, because it gives us a face to relate to the strange idea that spirals are meaningful. You have this man who absolutely obsesses over spirals, and it's weird to us. And not only is it weird to us, it's weird to the characters. It's weird to Suichi because he's never seen his dad like this. And it's definitely weird to Kiri because, you know, why Suichi's dad like this? If you had a boyfriend and his dad was obsessed with spirals, that should probably be a red flag. I don't know why, but like this book has made it towards a red flag in my mind. So in this first chapter, you pick up on the fact that there is more weirdness going on with the spirals than just Suichi's dad because there are whirlpools developing. And that's kind of weird. I think this story first becomes legitimately disturbing whenever you see Suichi's dad move his eyes and rotate them like spirals. He is able to rotate them and move them independently of one another and spins them around in his skull 
and it's just a kind of disgusting sight, and so I love Junji Ito for it. I think this book has some of Junji Ito's best art just because some of the depictions are legitimately creepy and weird and just detailed in a way that a horror comic needs to be. A few pages later, Suichi's dad starts to curl his tongue into a spiral, and it's one of those pages where it's like, uh, this is more weird than scary, it's kind of gross. So already you kind of see an example of what I'm talking about with the different kinds of horror being shown, but also, um, I feel like this is probably someone's fetish. This is not the only page I'll be saying that about, but, um, heads up, I guess there's an overlap between sexuality and horror, and, and it's enough of that for now. Then you jump ahead a couple days later to where you find out that Suichi's dad has died because what he did is he contorted himself, his entire body, into a spiral and he put himself into this little box. And even though this idea is silly, I think that it works within the context of this chapter because essentially this chapter chronicles one man's descent into madness. It starts off with Suichi's dad being like, huh, the spiral thing is kind of neat and then ends with him dying because of his obsession with it. So I think that if you want to make an abstract concept, like spirals, scary, then this is how you do it, is you connect it back to a human face. So anyways, they cremate Suichi's dad, as you do to someone who has spiraled themselves into a box, and then the smoke turns into a spiral itself, and then it drains into the pond, Dragonfly Pond, which is a little pond in the middle of town. Come here, vacation. It's like Toluca Lake, there's only dead people. Chapter two of the story is really interesting because it's where Suichi's mom begins to go crazy. As you might expect, someone who finds their husband wrapped up in a box into a spiral is not going to take that that well. So she starts going crazy and she becomes obsessed with the spiral, but in the opposite way that Suichi's dad was. Whereas Suichi's dad was completely fascinated and enamored with the spiral, Suichi's mom is horrified of it. So Suichi's mom, as a result of this, starts to cut off any parts of her body that have spirals in them. So she shaves her head and she cuts off her fingertips and she is hospitalized because of this. And so this panel of her cutting off her fingertips is so disgusting to me. And so I think that it's an example of grounded horror that just makes this entire work feel that much more gross and ugh, like, I don't know, it's gross, it's gross, I don't like it. I don't like it because it's 100% something that could happen and something that has happened, I would assume. So you have these more fantastical elements such as the idea of a guy contorting his body into a spiral but you have the realism in there. You have the human element. Suichi's mom doesn't see Suichi's dad and then go, oh, he's dead. No, instead she has a full on mental breakdown because this is a horrifying idea, seeing your loved one turned into a spiral. And so I think this is a really effective chapter just because of that, because it's a human reaction to a fantastical thing. Suichi's mom's reaction is a natural reaction to something that is unnatural or supernatural. And I think that so often in horror, people don't get that right. People don't get the human element right. And so that's why a lot of horror falls flat on its face. Because yeah, you can have any number of horrible monsters or disgusting settings or rusty barns or zombies or whatever else. But if you don't have the human element, then your horror is gonna be just nothing. Your horror will not land unless there is an emotional core to it. So Suichi's mom is hospitalized and then Suichi realizes that there is a spiral in your ear. Is it the cochlea? Is that how you pronounce it? An earwig tries to crawl into her ear and then she sees it as Suichi's dad and so you get some more disgusting, super detailed images like this one, which I absolutely love. And then the story ends with Suichi's mom dying because she realizes that there is a spiral in her ear so she takes scissors and stabs them out. And this goes back to the grounded, more realistic horror, the kind of event that could happen in real life and that's why I find it so disgusting and so disturbing is because it is real. It is something that could easily happen. So Suichi's mom harms herself in these ways that are disturbing and shocking to the viewer. But at the same time, this grounded horror is wedged in there between the more fantastical ideas of Suichi's dad contorting his body into a spiral and the dreams. And so after this, I think is really where the story begins to go off the rails. And we're only in chapter three and there are 19 chapters. So um, let's go for it. Chapter three is about this chick with a scar on her forehead. At the beginning of the story, it's a crescent, but the town being cursed turns it into a spiral. And then the spiral scar then turns into a vortex. And, and so the vortex begins consuming different things, including the girl. There are some really cool, disgusting images in this chapter, like the vortex sucking in the girl's eye, which I love. It's just weird and I'm just imagining all kinds of like slurpy sound effects to go with it. But then the end of the story is kind of silly because the vortex essentially consumes the girl whole. And it's like, well, all right. And so this is really where I start having problems with the story because there aren't any major ramifications or consequences to the ending of this story. In chapter one, Suichi's dad is turned into a spiral, which messes up Suichi's mom and Suichi. In chapter two, Suichi's mom goes crazy, which messes up Suichi. In chapter three, 
Suichi and Kiri see the scroll consumed by her own scar, essentially, which has turned into a vortex, and life goes on. And it's like, what? It's like, shouldn't we do something more with this? And it's like, no, no, we're just going to continue on like it never happened. And so it's a really cool chapter in and of itself, but at the same time, it doesn't progress the story. And I think that's the biggest problem with certain chapters in this work. Chapters like these are entertaining, but they don't make the work feel cohesive. And if you couldn't tell, the idea of a scar turning into a vortex, which then consumes people, is certainly more on the fantastical side of horror. And so for that reason, this chapter isn't as effective for me as the first couple stories were, but your mileage may vary. Chapter 4 is very interesting because it concerns Kiri's father, who is a potter. So after everything that's happened, Kiri's father begins using clay from an unknown source to make his pots. Turns out that the clay is from Dragonfly Pond, which if you remember is where Suichi's father's cremated body's smoke went. That was a weird sentence. The smoke of Suichi's cremated father's body went into Dragonfly Pond and therefore tainted the pond where Kiri's dad is getting the clay. I don't know if that's clear, but it's, it's right. So in short, Kiri's father is using some pretty screwed up clay. So he keeps on making pots out of this clay and then he puts them in the freaking kiln and then he lights them on fire and then the pots start screaming because they have the soul of Suichi's mom and dad in them. I think it's pretty screwed up to start lighting pots on fire that have human souls trapped in them. That's just where I draw the line personally. I mean, I understand that art involves some degree of suffering and pain, but like, I don't know about this. I don't know about this entire burning the souls of the damned for your weird freaking pots, but um, you do you. Then Suichi comes in and he's like, hey, why are you burning my parents' souls to make your pots? And then he uh, destroys the kiln and then the barn burns down that the kiln is in. And then they're like, well, time to move on with the story. It's kind of weird for a father to be burning the souls of his daughter's boyfriend's parents to make his pots. I'm not from a small Japanese town, so maybe this is what life is like. I don't know. For what it's worth, small American towns are weird. You got like incest and barn hoedowns and country music. Every southerner is a furry. Chapter 5 is like a Romeo and Juliet story about these two kids from families who hate each other and they're both poor families and they both hate each other for some reason because the, the story goes back hundreds of years or something, I don't know. Anyways, uh, the two kids love each other so much and so like Suichi's dad contorted himself, they contort themselves only they form into this giant rope and essentially they're a sea serpent and so they go into the sea and then they're never seen again. This is another story where it's like it doesn't do anything to move the plot forward, it's just kind of weird. And so again, Junji Ito is just doing different stuff. He's using different types of horror to fully embrace the spiral idea. I don't think all of it's as effective as the first chapters because I think those first chapters are actually very, very excellent and very disturbing. But chapters like this one where it's like, oh yeah, there are two lovers and then they turn into a big sea serpent. It's, I don't know, it's just not my thing, I guess. Chapter six is weird because the first page of chapter six is the most disturbing page in the whole entire story. I'll just read it to you. The other day, one of my classmates fell from the roof of the school. He'd been doing acrobatics on the handrail when he slipped. He'd always been a show-off trying to get people's attention. And yet, surrounded by the crowd, he somehow looked content. So essentially, this boy was doing tricks, and then he fell and died, and he's happy that people are paying attention to him. And I don't know, this last panel of him smiling while blood seeping through his eyes is just so disgusting and so disturbing to me. And so I think this is an example of the grounded horror that disgusts me so much. And I think that this is why this page in my head is the single most effective page in this entire 600 plus page story. The horror comes because the visuals are disturbing and shocking, but also just the emotional core of it is there and it's kind of depressing. This kid doesn't care that he's dying, he's just happy that people are paying attention to him. And it's like you could build an entire story based off of that idea alone. And so that's why the chapter following this page is kind of sad to me, because it's about Kiri's hair. Yeah, it's about Kiri's hair. Basically, her hair becomes sentient and it starts making spiral patterns so that way people pay attention to it. Then there's a girl who sees Kiri's hair doing spiral things and she wants her hair to do it too. So the town is crazy and so it makes her hair do spiral things too. I don't know, it's not really explained how that happens. It's not even really explained why Kiri's hair is doing spiral stuff in the first place other than just, oh, the town's weird. Anything can happen in Spiral Town. And then the story ends with Suichi cutting off Kiri's hair because it's absorbing her life force. And the other girl who's trying to one-up Kiri dies because her hair absorbed her life force and turned her into a skeleton. And this is another instance like the story of the girl with the scar whose scar turned into a spiral which then devoured her where it's like, you would think this would have a bigger effect on the main plot. A girl literally dying because her hair devoured her life force, but um, 
everyone just moves on with their lives and so I guess there's a lot of work to be done. I guess there's not much time to mourn for the girl with the spiral hair who died. There's not much time to mourn for the kid who fell off the roof because he was doing tricks. And it's one of those things where it's like I understand why this first page was included in this chapter because it's about a boy wanting people to pay attention to him and then the story is about two girls with hair trying to get people to pay attention to them. So I understand the connection but at the same time I think this first page is just so much more effective. So in this instance it feels to me like the first page is too grounded and realistic for the story that follows it which is far too fantastical and silly I think. Because I'm not gonna lie the idea of having spinning hair isn't really scary to me. If someone pitched me the idea of a story where someone's hair is scary then I wouldn't I wouldn't buy it. I would go, no, why would I, no, hair isn't scary. I don't know. I mean, maybe mullets. I don't really like mullets, but it's more of a personal thing. Comment down below if you have a mullet and let me know why. If you say you have a mullet because James Hetfield had one in the 90s, then that's, that's a fair reason, honestly, I guess. I can't take any issue with that. Or if you don't have a mullet, just leave a comment and say, I don't have a mullet. I think it would just be funny to click on a video like this and then every comment is just like, I don't have a mullet. I don't have a mullet. I don't have a mullet. Oh yeah, the girls have a big hair battle. Yeah. I don't know, that's not, it's kind of silly. You hit chapter seven, Jack in the Box, and again, you're hit with another instance of realistic horror that is therefore scary to me. Basically, this boy, Jack in the Box, as they call him, is just trying to love Kiri and show how much he loves her. So he tries to give her a present and she rejects it and she's like, leave me alone, please. I have a boyfriend and also I don't want you to jump out and scare me because that's why people call him Jack in the Box is because he jumps out and scares people. Maybe it's a good idea to start trying that with girls to just, you know, see them standing there and then I jump out and then I go, Rawr! and then if they run away, it just wasn't true love. That's all. If they run away from me after I scare the crap out of them, then they miss their one shot at happiness, I guess. That's on them, not on me. So anyways, this kid is like, Kiri, let me show you how much I love you. My love for you will stop this car. And then he stands in front of a car and Kiri goes, no. And then the kid gets freaking creamed by the car. It just totally kills this guy and he gets all wrapped up under the car's tires. It's just like, this is really screwed up after a chapter wherein girls' hairs were fighting each other. Because that was more fun and silly and then this is more like, oh crap, like, Again, again, we're going to the realistic, disgusting horror. So because of the fact that the types of horror in the story are very uneven, the tone of the story is very uneven, I think. And so then Kiri opens up the gift that the Jack in the Box guy was trying to give her, and surprise, surprise, it's a Jack in the Box. And then she thinks that she hears the toy talk and say that the kid's gonna come back. And so Suichi and her then go, and then Suichi's like, let's stab him through the heart. Like he's a vampire, I guess. <laughs> so they go and they dig him up in the graveyard right after he's buried. And then he rises up like he's a zombie. And then he starts jumping after them because he's a jack in the box. And so he's jumping. And so this art is actually very disgusting. And so I like it because of that. But at the same time, the visual of a zombie essentially just jumping after people and hop frogging is so silly. I don't know, it just feels like a contradiction of ideas. It's kind of like, imagine if you saw the scariest thing ever, the Grim Reaper and he was on a skateboard. So anyways, this kid is jumping after them and then body parts start falling off and out of him. So I think that's awesome because it's gross. So he starts boinging after them and then it turns out that it's just a spring from the car that crashed into him. And then once more, Kiri and Suichi just kind of go, well, that's the end of that. We're never bringing this up again. So this is another story that's weird just because it's like, hey, this doesn't really move the plot forward. It barely has anything to do with the spiral curse, it feels like. Chapter 8's really weird because it's about this fat kid who comes into school every single day it rains, but never any time it doesn't rain, and he's always wet and slimy and gross looking. And there's a bully who makes fun of this kid and mocks him, and the kid just seems real weird and greasy and grimy and disgusting. So then they're playing volleyball, and then the fat kid makes the bully's team lose because he's on the bully's team. And then they start harassing him and take off all his clothes, because apparently that's the natural reaction you have to whenever you feel that someone has wronged you, even though they didn't. Yeah, I don't know about the kids, bro. They're freaking nuts. And then they notice that he has a big spiral on his back and um, that's weird. And so anyways, he just keeps on coming in any day it rains. Then the spiral turns into a giant shell, like he's a snail. And then he turns into a snail. And so as a snail, this fat kid just roams around the school windows and then they call his parents and they're like, come get your son. And they're like, that's not our freaking son. That's a giant snail. What do you want us to do? I don't know why it's normal for them to see a big snail and then just go, oh yeah. That's normal. But anyways, they see the big human sized snail and they go, nah, that's not our son. And then they peace out. So then the school keeps the fat kid as a snail and they feed him and stuff. I don't know why you would keep someone who turned into a snail as a pet, but that's just, again, that's just rural Japan, I guess. Just small town Japan, just keeping snail people. 
Back in small town America, we got the bear people, got the Wendigo, we got skinwalkers, we got Jeb, he was absorbed by aliens. So anyways, you have the fat kid who's a snail now. And then the bully, in an ironic twist of fate for some unclear reason, also becomes a snail. And so then they put the bully and the fat kid and the snail pen together where they're both snails. And then it turns out that one of them gets the other pregnant because they're hermaphrodites. So the bully and fat kid, one of them got the other pregnant. I don't know which way is worse, honestly. Remember when I was talking about the tongue and I said that it was someone's fetish? I, I don't know who has a fetish for, for snail boys getting each other pregnant. Here you are, though. Here's your gift. Thank Mr. Ito for this. So then the teacher sees that the fat kid and the bully escape and they laid eggs. So then he stomps on all the eggs and then he comes into school the next day and he's a snail. And then the story cuts off there and it's like, I feel like there should be more. I feel like you should see more of the teacher, but you don't, it just kind of cuts off and you forget about the snails for, you know, like eight chapters or something. But anyways, um, yeah, I don't, I don't really feel all that comfortable with the, the two boys mating with each other and then playing mollusk eggs. And I don't know about this one, dude. This entire chapter is kind of whack. Then you have the Black Lighthouse, which is a lot like the movie The Lighthouse, in that they both have lighthouses. Please laugh. That was a really hard joke to come up with. Please, please consider laughing. Thank you for laughing. Anyways, the Black Lighthouse just makes a big beam, and then people keep on going up into the lighthouse, and then they don't come back. And also, it starts making people spin. It starts making people spin, because this is a book about spirals. So people are spinning in spirals after the black lighthouse does its thing. Again, I'm gonna be the one to say it, but I don't really find the idea of people spinning to be all that scary. I know, I know, I'm quite the contrarian, aren't I? But I mean, you got like a lady spinning with her handbag here. Please, someone help me, I can't stop. I'm spinning in a circle. This is the scariest scene I've seen all day. People just spinning around in a circle like they're a clogged toilet or something. But yeah, the lighthouse is actually really a cool idea because uh, people go up into it and it becomes more and more weird and twisted and spirally. So Kiri's brother goes into the lighthouse with some other boys and then Kiri chases them and goes, hey, why are you going into this place where people went and then didn't come back? So Kiri runs up to the top of the lighthouse and she sees that the lamp is screwed up and the sun is setting and so the lighthouse is about to start spreading its lights or spinning it's about to turn on so then she runs with her brother and then a couple other boys so then she's running and then uh one boy trips and then there's a giant flame wall that comes and it burns a little kid alive i don't know about how this book is treating minors honestly uh it seems like there's a a lot of weird stuff happening. Anyways, I like it because it's like the Terminator scene. It's like the scene on the back of my shirt where it's the skeleton and it's like, Brr. just look at the kid. He's like, Brr. actually look at his legs. Why are his legs like that? I think his spine is freaking broken and that's why his body's contorted like that. Doesn't even matter that he's on fire. The kid was dead anyways. His spine was broken like the spine on my book. You got chapter 10, which is mosquitoes. This one's kind of whack. I don't really understand chapter 10 because basically Kiri gets stuck in the hospital because of the burns that she sustained while running away from the kids screaming and dying. She left a child to die and she escapes with some minor burns. Seems fair. So anyways, she's in the hospital and then pregnant women are showing up and then the pregnant women at nighttime are using these little hand drills and they're sucking all the blood from people and killing them. And they're drinking the blood like they're vampires, but they're actually mosquitoes because that's why the story is called mosquitoes because they're mosquitoes and they're sucking the people's blood. So we're definitely at the part of the story where it feels like things are just kind of happening and there are a lot of cool things happening. I think every chapter in this is very enjoyable, but at the same time, most of these chapters aren't really progressing the story. Most of them aren't actually moving the plot forward. And I think they're sick and I think they're gross and I really like them, but at the same time, it feels weird to me to think of Uzumaki as a long piece. But the thing is, it is a long story because it involves the same characters and events carry over from one chapter to the next, even if they probably need more explanation than they get. It feels like there honestly aren't too many consequences between stories. I will say this though, um, the idea of a pregnant woman drilling into you and then sucking your blood, that also feels like a fetish. I'm sure you could find some weird stuff if you Google that. I'm not even Googling that as a joke. It's just, um, yeah, I ain't, I ain't touching that. So anyways, all these pregnant women have these babies that were nourished by human blood. And so Kiri is about to leave this hospital, having finally recovered from the burns of the screaming dead kid. And so she goes to check on her cousin, who was one of the women who drank blood and then delivered a baby. 
and all the babies have these puffed up stomachs, I guess. And then Kiri asks about it, and then all the pregnant women give her like a <laughs> And then the babies start to cry, and then Kiri immediately trips and falls down the stairs and then has to stay in the hospital another week. And it's like, this isn't even meant to be comedic, but the entire idea of spending months recovering in a hospital and then immediately falling down the stairs and having to stay in the hospital for longer is just comedy gold. It made me laugh. There's no way it didn't make other people laugh as well. So it's like, come on, come on. Let's just admit it's silly. He could have worked it into the spiral motif somehow. He could have made the stairs circular. Could have had Carrie walking down spiral stairs and then she trips down them and then she goes, oh, this was the curse of the town, the curse of the spiral. So then anyways, uh, Carrie sees these babies talking in the nursery and they're talking and they're talking about how they want to be returned back into the womb. I don't know why the babies are talking, but you know, it's just the spiral, I guess. And also their umbilical cords are the reason why their stomachs are puffy because they're grown into these mushroom shaped things. You got these umbilical cords that are growing placentas and then they drop on the ground and then the doctor eats them and feeds them to the patients. And I'm really hungry right now. It's uh, it's not quite midnight and they look really tasty. And someone's playing music outside and I don't like that. I'm trying to record a freaking video at 11.30 at night and then someone's just like Okay, they stopped. You have the doctor who delivered the babies and then he's he's putting them back into the mother. It's a really screwed up concept and I love it because of it. Again, I don't even know what we're doing at this point. I don't know what this has to do with the spirals, but like that, that's screwed up. So I like it. Good job, Junjito. As I was saying at the beginning of this video, I think that this story is really able to engage with a bunch of different types of horror just because it is so freaking entertaining and it's so wildly creative and just excellent. It's just great fun to read and it's so disgusting and every chapter is different. And so because of that, that's why this is Junji Ito's best work. It's not his most cohesive work, but honestly, none of his long form stories are really that cohesive. I feel like every single long form story that Junji Ito has written has the same problem which is that it cannot stay focused. He's constantly introducing new characters or new places or new ideas, and it doesn't ever feel like any of his long form stories have a clear beginning, middle, and end. It feels like you can never predict what's gonna happen from one chapter to the next just because he throws random bullcrap in. And so it is a problem, but in a work like this, you just kind of learn to love it. And I think you will only have a good time with this work if you accept that about it, if you accept its ever-changing nature. Some people see Junji Ito's work as being dreamlike and surreal, and I think it is surreal, but dreamlike, I don't know if I would go so far as to say that. I think that towards the end of this work, Definitely, definitely for sure. But quite frankly, if I'm being completely honest, I think that most of the time whenever they use Dreamlike to talk about his work, they're just kind of referring to the fact that he doesn't properly conclude certain things. A lot of his stories are just kind of messy and all over the place, and that in and of itself doesn't make it Dreamlike. Whenever I think of something Dreamlike, I think of something like Silent Hill or Signalis or Eraserhead or The Blind Owl. I think of works that are maybe abstract or weird or loose on the surface, yet have a strong emotional core which holds them together. I think that if you want to make something surreal and have it stick, that's how you do it. You have the story, the events, the people, the characters, the places, you have it all be weird, but still in spite of that, it needs to have that human element like I was talking about earlier. You can have the weirdest monsters, the weirdest places, the weirdest characters, but if your readers don't feel anything, then it won't stick. But still in spite of that, I think that Junji Ito makes this work work because of the fact that it's just so creative and it's so interesting. Because whenever I read this, I don't really feel anything emotionally. The characters don't really have much depth and they don't respond like normal people would. Aside from Suichi's mom, which I think that's a pretty normal reaction to go crazy upon seeing your husband in a weird spiral box. But I think that so far as Kiri and Suichi go, it's one of those things where they just keep on seeing weird bullcrap and they're never really too affected by it. So this story is really good, but it's just messy. Again, to reiterate the point, Uzumaki is a messy masterpiece. Chapter 12 is a story about a spiral in the form of a storm. Basically, the storm wants Kiri. It chases her around, it calls out to her, Suichi and her try to hide from it, but still it manages to get them in the end. It gets them and then it just kind of spits them back out into Dragonfly Pond after they spent the entire chapter running away from it. And so again, this is just a story with a really abrupt ending and nothing really happens because of it. Like it's a cool idea, it's a cool idea to have the storm chasing them, but at the same time, it doesn't ever really result in anything. So in chapter 13, because the storm from the previous chapter wrecked their home, Carrie and her family move into this abandoned row house. Basically it's this piece of crap house and there are some people and they're growing spikes. And then her family starts growing spikes and then they have a weird creepy neighbor who's like 
hitting on Kiri, even though she's a high schooler, and he starts growing spikes. Then he turns into a giant spike monster at the end, and then he starts chasing Kiri. And then there's another storm, and a big spike goes into the spike man's neck. But this spike is like made of wood. It's not made of like flesh or bone or whatever the spikes are made of. And everyone starts growing spikes because they're spirals, and so the the town is spirals and spiral spikes, spires on the head of the spike man. Spikes and spirals and spires, and I don't have much else to say. Chapter 14 is officially where we hit the end part of the story. Whereas many of the preceding chapters are very loose and don't really connect all that strongly to one another, chapters 14 through 19 connect directly from one chapter to the next. In essence, the entire spiral idea is turned up to 11. There are all these other storms and they've just wiped out the entire area and people keep on trying to go into the town and they keep on getting trapped in the town. And this is where it really, really becomes clear if it wasn't already that the town is cursed by spirals. And so this section of the story is where things really start to coalesce and come together into one cohesive story. So because the town is cursed at this point, tornadoes are being created if you so much as talk or if you blow, make a move with your hand. Everything that I'm doing right now should be creating tornadoes, but alas, we live in real life and not in this small Japanese town, which is cursed by the curse of the spiral. So now it just looks like I'm conducting an orchestra that isn't even there. So anyways, kids and other people are going around destroying the entire town, basically blowing these vortexes at buildings. The only buildings that do not get destroyed by the vortexes are the row houses. Remember the abandoned house I mentioned earlier? Well, those, those are indestructible. And it gets really silly because people are able to ride these twisters and so there are big gangs of people and they're like tough guys and they're like, hey, we're riding on the tornadoes because we're blowing down towns. Like you remember the fat kid and the bully from chapter 8 with the snails and the fetishes? Well anyways, there are a bunch more snail people now and so the guys riding on tornadoes eat the snail people and they crawl into their shell and they, they eat the snail people's faces. And the idea of people turning into snails and then other people eating them is kind of screwed up and so I kind of like it because of that. In case you haven't caught on, I like the most screwed up stuff about this book. Not because it's screwed up, but because I'm insane and I find it interesting. So basically everyone is trying to find a way to get out of town and find a way to get away from these weird vortex riding gangs and these kids who keep on destroying buildings and whatever else. And no one seems to be able to get out of town. No matter how far they go, no matter where they walk, no matter if they try to ride on a boat or in a car, they are all stuck in town. Either a whirlpool will consume them if they are stuck in a boat, or if they walk through the town, they just end up back at the same place where they started. And so Kiri is carrying her brother, who's beginning to turn into a snail. So Kiri lets go of her brother because he turns into a snail, and so they're trying to get away from the people who want to eat the snails. So they just put him on the side of a cliff and go, go, go snail, go. That's what I would do to my brother if he turned into a snail. And she is with Suichi, and they walk and walk and then they end up back where they start, only years have passed. So while Suichi and Kiri were walking and years seemed to pass, what people realized was that the row houses, the abandoned row houses were indestructible, right? And so if they just expanded those, then like they were safe basically. So people began expanding the houses and they began connecting the abandoned houses to each other and they created a huge spiral pattern. So all the people in the row houses, they started twisting into each other and combining with one another like the sea serpent or like Suichi's father or something like that. They began contorting their bodies into one giant mass. So because Suichi is an orphan, Kiri and Suichi decide to find Kiri's parents who are said to be by Dragonfly Pond. You know, the pond with the clay. Suichi's dad and his mom were in the clay and then Kiri's dad was lighting them on fire, burning them every single night to try to make pots. So Kiri and Suichi are trying to get to the center of the town where Dragonfly Pond is supposed to be because that's where they think Kiri's parents are. So at this point, the row houses all form this giant spiral leading into the center of town, right? So anyways, they get to the center of town and the pond is no longer there. Instead, there are these steps that seem to be ancient. And it's believed that the pond was covering up these steps. So anyways, they begin walking down this huge, huge, huge set of steps. And then Suichi is attacked by just like one random Mr. Fantastic looking dude. This is the second video in a row where I've referenced Mr. Fantastic and I hate it. I don't even like the Fantastic Four. Go watch my Code Veronica video if you haven't. I talked about what it would be like if a butt opened up and then there was an eye there. <laughs> So anyways, Suichi falls into this giant hole and then Kiri makes her way down these steps and then sinks down and then there's this giant spiral city and super cool looking. It's freaking beautiful and this is where the story starts to feel a little bit like At the Mountains of Madness by Lovecraft. Essentially underneath this small Japanese town there was this giant spiral city and all the people are becoming part of the spiral city. 
I feel like Spiral City sounds like Party City or something like that. Spiral City. We sell spirals and nothing else. We sell snails that mate with each other and that's it. At Spiral City. And so essentially the ending of the story is just that there's this giant spiral city underneath the ground and that is the entire point of the spiral curse. And so Suichi has a couple different theories which serve as explanations for the spiral city which are just essentially that this cycle has played out many times before where the town is cursed by the spiral and so people start doing stuff with the spiral and weird stuff starts happening and then eventually the town is devoured by the spiral city underneath the ground and then it just happens and everything loops again and uh, there's another town built on top of the old town and then the spiral curse happens again once every hundred years or something like that and there are no traces of the previous town and then they build a new town and then spiral city happens again and so basically in the end it just seems like Suichi and Kiri are able to be together and they're together in love and in death, I guess. I guess it's one of those endings. So it's bittersweet because everyone kind of dies in the end, but they die together, and so that's something. And so I think this story is really interesting for so many reasons. First off, it's just a really fun, creative, enjoyable, just entertaining read. But also Junji Ito just seems to be interested in figuring out how far you can stretch a single idea. How many different bits of horror can you get from one idea? That idea of being spirals. He includes silly stuff like the stuff with the hair or the guys blowing vortexes and then riding on them. He includes stuff that's just really weird like the babies wanting to be put back into their mothers or the snails. And then he includes stuff that is just really horrific and disgusting like the kid who fell off the building and is happy that people paid attention to him even though he's dying. Or the boy who stands in front of a car and lets a car hit him to try to illustrate his love for Kiri. And so I think this book is a masterpiece. I think it's absolutely freaking messy, but I think it's a masterpiece just because it's so much fun to read. And I think that's the most pure way that something can be a masterpiece. Because I don't think Junji Ito is trying to do something mind-bending here. I don't think Junji Ito is trying to do something that's meant to be heavily analyzed or broken down. I don't think that Junji Ito is trying to create some kind of difficult work that is only for the most intelligent reader to understand. I think that in this story, all Junji Ito really is doing is just throwing any idea in there that he finds creative or interesting, and I think that more so than any other story of his, I think it works. Because again, there are plenty of chapters that I don't feel contribute to the plot or move it forward, yet at the same time, I enjoyed reading them. Even though the girl with the scar didn't really move the plot forward, I still enjoyed reading that chapter. Even though the lighthouse is kind of silly because it has the boy going up in flames, and even though it doesn't move the story all that forward other than Kiri ending up in the hospital, I still enjoyed the chapter. And even though parts of this story are scarier than others, I still enjoyed the whole thing. So really, I don't think it's a good idea to try to make something like this. I don't think it's a good idea to try to make something that is messy and involves as many different ideas as you possibly can fit into it. I think that if you try to intentionally do something like that, then it will be messy but in a way that is confusing and distracting, as opposed to wholly enjoyable. And even with this, I think there's absolutely an argument to be made that what Junji Ito does here is distracting, and it is confusing. And I think you could easily argue that it is messy and not in a good way. But at the same time, I just had too much fun with the story to really hate on it for that. So rereading this story reminds me exactly of why Junji Ito is so big and so popular at this point in time. Rereading this story makes me remember why I first started rereading Junji Ito stuff in the first place, and why I first became determined to read just about anything that gets published by him over here in America. This is Junji Ito at his best, pure and simple. I think it's a great story, I think it's a lot of fun, and I know they're adapting this into an anime, but I'll be really interested in seeing how they do it, because I know they're gonna have to cut some stuff, so I'll be interested in seeing what they cut and what they keep and so on. So in conclusion, I think that this book is messy, I think that it showcases a lot of different types of horror, and I think it's great. So thank you for watching this. I'll leave a playlist link to all my other Junji Ito videos as well as a playlist link to all my other horror videos. I do a lot of random bullcrap on this channel. I just mostly do whatever I want. So check it out if you want. Um, otherwise, I'm going to bed. So thanks for watching. Have a nice night. Bye. Spiral City. Spiral City is a place where you buy spirals. For you and me. At Spiral City. Spiral City, the city of the spirals. Spiral City, 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 spiral city. Spiral City, spiral, spiral city. Spiral, spiral, spiral city. Spiral City is the city where the spirals are. They're there for you and me. Spiral City.
Bye, Rosie.